Let's pray. Father, we're your people. This is your book, and we wait. In this place, may we hear the soft sound of sandaled feet. Forgive the one who teaches his sins, because there are many. We would see Jesus and him only. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want you to know this is a first for me. I have never, ever in church preached a sermon when I was wearing jeans. When I was a young pastor in Boston, I wore a clerical collar, a long black robe, the Reformation Puritan tabs, a stole appropriate to the ecclesiastical season. And I want you to know, quite handsome. <laughs> and now it's come to this. And it's your fault. Thanks a lot. <laughs> This is the beginning of Passion Week, and I love this time of the church year. I don't like Christmas much, and that's hard if you look like Santa Claus. I mean, I'd like it a lot better if they'd leave Jesus out of it. I like the parties and the other stuff. Since we don't know for sure when Jesus was born, I don't know why we don't just give it to the pagans. Have a good time and enjoy it and celebrate our own at a different time. But the pagans haven't taken this one over yet. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons. They've tried with a bunny and all, but they haven't succeeded, and I like that. It begins in Jerusalem. It moves to a hill in the shape of a skull where a man dies on crossbeams between two thieves. It then goes to a tomb and a corpse, and then it moves to a time when a dead man got up and walked and said we could too. I love this time. I love the thought of it. I love contemplating it. I love talking about it. I love reading about it. So let's start where the Bible starts. If you have your Bible, I'm going to read the account in the gospel according to Mark, the 11th chapter, beginning at the first verse. And then we're going to flip over to Luke for a little extra insight into the triumphal entry. This is what Mark writes. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and we'll send it back here immediately. He went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street as they untied it. And some of those standing there said to him, What are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it. And he sat on it, and many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, 
as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. And then flip over with me to Luke, and I'm reading from the 19th chapter, and I'll start at the uh, 39th verse. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Now, we're going to talk about the sound of a stone this morning, but first, I want to go down a side road, and I don't want you to miss God's underground. It may have been a miracle. Jesus may have given the abilities of the Son of God, foreseen that there would be a donkey in a certain place, and supernaturally ask his disciples to go into the city. When they found the donkey, bring the donkey to him. But I don't think that's what happened. Jesus had spent a long time in Jerusalem. I think he had made friends there. He has friends in funny places, high and low. He has friends, and those friends would surprise you. And I believe that's what happened here. These were the friends of Jesus, God's underground. I remember when our older daughter in her senior year at college went on a youth hostel trip to different nations in Europe. <laughs> I remember saying, honey, that's great. Any adults going along? And mistake, she pulled herself up. She's little, but she's big when she stretches. And she said, what do you mean, adults? And then I shut up. However, I'm a father, and I have friends in funny places. And so I made sure that in every country, and she doesn't even know this to this day, in every country, in every city where she visited, there was somebody there standing by, ready to help. Is that cool or what? That's what God has done for us. It's amazing. Speaking of Robin, she was born in Boston. We had moved from the mountains of North Carolina didn't know a soul in Boston, and Anna was pregnant, and we were scared to death. Have you ever seen how many doctors there are in the Boston phone book? I mean, a hundred billion, and we didn't know a single one. So we opened the phone book, put our finger on a name, and called her, and her name was Ruby Jackson, and she was absolutely wonderful. She was motherly. She was so good to calm this nervous father. She was kind all the time. And it wasn't until Robin had been born and weeks later that we found out that she was a Christian and that she had been praying for us every day. And she called when we first moved to Florida. She had retired and she said to Anna, how's that girl? Did she grow up? How did she turn out? I've been praying for her all along, and, and we realized that in a very lonely and dark place for us, kids who were scared to death, not knowing a single soul, God has his underground watching and looking. Vin Maloney was the director, the head of the Yankee News Network, well known throughout New England, and mean as a snake. I did news for him, and that was a scary experience. When he stood outside the news booth after I finished a newscast and he was red-faced, he would sometimes have his rosary beads in his hands, and he would say, oh, God, sometimes I pray for patience. And then our first Thanksgiving came along. He said, hey, Brown. I said, what? He said, you want to come over to our house for Thanksgiving? And I thought, no, I don't think so. <laughs> but we went to his farmhouse, and I remember sitting around that dead, that table with all that food, 
and looking at Vinny, and I realized he's my brother in Christ. Jesus told him to, they're everywhere. Everywhere. Whenever we go to a restaurant, we get ready to say a blessing. I always say to the waiter or the waitress, hey, son, we're getting ready to pray. You want anything? <laughs> and they laugh, and some of them say, you a Christian too? They don't wear badges, but they're everywhere. They could be the clerk in the grocery store. Could be the pilot on the airplane you fly, the way it was when I flew to India and was scared to death. They're everywhere, and you're a part of that. God's underground. Be sensitive, because your family, they're like weeds. Can't get rid of them. And I thought, I thought I would remind you, you're never alone. His underground is there. And when you're in need, it'll be okay. If you've been around the church very long, you've been through a lot of Palm Sundays, you know that this is almost a farce. <laughs> I mean, it's cool that they shouted praise and Hosanna at the beginning, but on Friday, this same bunch were shouting crucify and crucify. So it's kind of like a dance on the Titanic. I used to wonder, why in the world do we celebrate this day? It really is a farce. And why did Jesus, and he knew what was going to happen. He knew they were going to hang him on a cross. He knew what they were going to shout. He even could feel the spittle running down his face. And yet, he didn't stop the party. What's, what's with that? Not only that, when the uptight, and I'm sure they're Presbyterians, when the uptight Pharisees had said, Jesus, can't you do something about this noise? Can't you do something about these, your disciples? And Jesus said, and I love this, if they were quiet and still, and Presbyterian, even the rocks would cry out. What's with that? Why do we celebrate this? Knowing what's, why did Jesus allow the party knowing what was happening? Well, I'm going to tell you. Because there's some things that you can't make be silent. Let's talk about it. For instance, Grief is hardly ever silent. The word Hosanna is an exclamation of praise and joy, but that's not the etymology of the word. The word is used one time in the Old Testament, and it's the 118th Psalm. And in that Psalm, there's a lament, and there's a cry, and Hosanna comes from two Hebrew words. And you know what they mean? Please help me. Please save me. Grief is hardly ever quiet. I, when I'm sick, I don't want you around. But I do want you to know I'm sick. <laughs> So I'm going to tell everybody where it hurts and how much it hurts. And then I'm going to say, now leave me alone. Why do I have to tell them? Because grief is hardly ever silent. And when there's any hope of help, that is doubly so. We interviewed Garth Cross this week. That's a pen name, by the way. He's written a book called Outside the Camp. Let me tell you the story behind the story. Six years ago, and I'd forgotten, uh, he was on our mailing list and he called me. And I talked to him. He had sinned really bad. Uh, he'd hurt a lot of people. He was being disciplined and eventually he was kicked out of the church, rejected by all of his friends. He used the pen name Gart Cross because he wanted to protect the people that would be hurt if he talked too negatively about him. 
And he said, that day, Steve, and I'd forgotten, he said, you said, you're going to get over this. You're going to get on the other side and take what you've learned and write a book about it. And he said in the introduction, this book is written because Steve encouraged me to do it. As I looked at the title, Outside the Camp, a former pastor, I thought, oh my, I hope it's not one of those hate books, and it wasn't. It was a book of great love for the church, great commitment to Jesus Christ, great gentleness, great kindness. And it's organized after he finishes the story into three laments. And he said on our broadcast when we interviewed him that we forget sometimes that the lot of the scripture is lament. That's true, by the way. We're not called to be silent when it hurts. I don't, I don't know what you're going through right now. Maybe you have memories of sexual abuse. Wonder where God was when you faced that. Maybe you've been rejected by people you loved and you thought cared about you. Maybe your husband told you last night that he didn't love you anymore. Or maybe you said to your husband that you were glad. Maybe you have physical problems, cancer. Maybe you have kids that aren't walking with Christ anymore. Do not, for God's sake, suffer in silence. Grief should not be silent. God did not design it to be silent. He called us to speak up and tell our Father where it hurts. The great thing about Palm Sunday the triumphal entry of Jesus is that Jesus is here this morning. You cry loud at the top of your lungs because he hears and he cares. Grief is hardly ever silent. Praise is hardly ever silent either. Our younger daughter, Jennifer, when she was growing up, had a poster in her bedroom. Do you all remember Ziggy? Most of you weren't even alive. <laughs> but there was this cartoon character named Ziggy. And she had a, and by the way, Jennifer signs her letters, love and laughter. Now, she's always been this way. She had this big poster with Ziggy standing on the top of a mountain as a sunrise was coming up. And Ziggy's jumping up and down and saying, yay, God. Yay, God. <laughs> you know that old story about... Uh, about the Pentecostal woman who wandered into a Presbyterian church. She tried to do things decently and in order because that's what we're about in this place. But the preacher kept talking about Jesus and she kept getting excited. <laughs> he talked about he had died on a cross for her sins and she was free. And she wanted to say something. She gripped the back of the pew until her knuckles were white. And finally, she simply couldn't do it anymore. She jumped up and said, praise God. Praise God Almighty. And a usher came over and said, Madam, you can't do that here. What are you, an idiot? The rocks will cry out. I don't know about you, but sometimes... And people say, Steve, you're so authentic because you're so real about your sin. Are you out of your mind? I just don't want you to be surprised when you find out. <laughs> I'm really not a good person. I struggle with this in ways you wouldn't even believe. And today when we were saying, I love the worship this morning. When we sang about God's grace... And forgiveness, I wanted to jump up and say, praise God Almighty, <laughs> I'm forgiven. And sometimes when I think how lovable I am, no, that's a lie. How unlovable I am. The things I've said to my wife, to my friends I care about, 
the way I've snapped at people. Just ask Kathy over here. She's been working for me for 8,000 years. The only reason I'm nice to her is she knows so much dirt on me. But let me, let me tell you something. When I realize that God thinks I'm something else, who really likes me better than he likes you, a, a, God, a God who can't even have a party unless I'm there, a God who admires me, and looks at me, and is glad for me, and created me, and promised to get me home before the dark. Sometimes I can't be silent. I got a, I got a call from a missionary friend of mine in Mexico this week. He said, Steve, you're not going to believe this. The third highest man in our gigantic drug cartel just came to Christ. I said, you're making that up. He said, no, I'm not. And he's telling everybody, I don't even know if they're going to let him live. And then he said, wait, wait. And he texted me a picture of this guy. I looked at the picture, and I wrote my friend back. I said, man, I almost spoke in tongues. That is so, God's doing that everywhere. He's doing that in your life, even if it doesn't feel like it. He really, you're forgiven. You say, you don't know what, I, I don't care. You're forgiven. You're loved. You're in the process of being healed. He's fixing it. And you can't remain silent. That's why you're here. You're being Presbyterian when you're here, but we're going to a picnic after this. And you can shout as much as you want to, and you should, because praise is hardly ever silent. But there's one other thing. Grief is hardly ever silent, and praise is hardly ever silent, and Jesus is never silent. Why was he riding a donkey instead of a white horse? Why did he wear a robe instead of armor? because he was identifying with his people, with me, and with you. You know what I've been reading this week? Uh, J.D. Lance's book, Hillbilly Elegy. I didn't want to read it because I knew it was some arrogant northern elitist twit who was going to look down his nose with his peacock feathers flying in the breeze and make fun of people like me from the mountains of North Carolina. And my friend said, no, 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 you're gonna love this. And so I got the book and I started reading and my friend was right. This guy is a graduate of Yale. He's a Yale trained lawyer. He's making a lot of money. And he said, I wanna rise up and call my people blessed. And so as he talks about the pain and the darkness, the abuse, the hurt, the pride, the strength, the courage of the people in the mountains of West Virginia and the people in the Rust Belt in the north where they migrated and they always came back to the mountains as he related his boyhood experiences, he identified, he said, these are my people. I'm a redneck. I'm a hillbilly. And I've loved the book because he never got away from his people. Jesus knew his place too. It wasn't with the Pharisees and the leaders and the elite, it's with us. And that's what the triumphal entry is all about. Jesus saying, I'm here. I got your back. I'll fix it. Passion Week. I love this week. It's a farce. Napoleon said one time when he came back from one of his campaigns, one of his, the first in command, the crowds were praising Napoleon and, and his first in command said, it must be delightful to have the crowds praising your name. And Napoleon said, nonsense. With a little bit change of circumstances, this same bunch 
would call for my hanging. He was right. People are really fickle. But Jesus had the party anyway. It started in Jerusalem. It moved to a mock trial and then to an execution on a cross and then to a graveyard and then to a dead man who got up and walked and he's still walking. He walked to Florida. He walked to Winter Springs and he walked to the Willow Creek Church this morning. And we should now and at the picnic at the top of our lungs shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And if you listen to what I taught you this morning, you know why. You think about that. Amen.